pick up a newspaper on any given day and you're likely to read about the most recent in an ongoing series of employment discrimination settlements. These cases involve all forms of discrimination, including race, religion, sex, and age. Anyone having anything to do with any aspect of the employment process is expected to have a basic knowledge of EEO laws. So, let's get started. Federal employment laws exist to ensure individuals the right to compete for all work opportunities without bias because of their race, color, religion, sex, national origin, age, or disability. Many state laws extend beyond this coverage to matters such as sexual orientation. Certain aspects of key employment legislation may not appear on the surface to relate directly to interviewing, but a closer examination reveals a correlation with the interviewing process. The following employment laws and categories of discrimination re represent major federal statute, rules, and regulations. This list is not all-inclusive. Employers are urged to obtain a copy of these and other laws relevant to their business practice. Unless otherwise noted, copies of the laws may be obtained from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or EEOC. Many people are surprised to learn that employment-related laws have been around for nearly 150 years. One of the earliest pieces of legislation was the Civil Rights Act of 1866. The portion most relevant to today's employers is Section 1981, Title 42, which ensures that all people have the same equal rights under the law as enjoyed by white citizens to make or enforce employment contracts. Essentially, this has been interpreted to mean that discrimination against non-whites in the making of written or implied contracts relevant to hiring and promotions is illegal. The law was originally intended to support charges of race discrimination and was expanded in 1982 to include national origin discrimination. It applies to all employers regardless of the number of employees. This is probably the best known piece of civil rights legislation and the most widely used as the Civil Rights Act of 1964 protects several classes of people and pertains to so many employment situations, including interviewing. Title VII of this act prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin in all matters of employment. Criteria for coverage under Title VII include any company doing business in the United States that has 15 or more employees. Violations are monitored by the EEOC. Violators of Title VII are generally required to make whole, which includes providing reinstatement if relevant and back pay. Jury trials are not allowed. Plaintiffs in Title VII suits generally need not prove intent. Rather, they may challenge apparently neutral employment policies having a discriminatory effect. The Equal Pay Act of 1963 requires equal pay for men and women performing substantially equal work. The work must be of comparable skill, effort, and responsibility, and performed under similar working conditions. Coverage applies to all money-related aspects of the employment process, including starting salaries, annual increases, and promotions. This law protects women only. Men who feel they're being discriminated against in matters of pay may claim violation of Title VII. Criteria for coverage is at least two employees. Unequal pay for equal work is permitted in certain circumstances, such as when wage differences are based on superior educational credentials or extensive prior experience. This pay difference, however, should diminish and ultimately disappear after a number of years on the job, assuming job performance supports equivalent pay increases. An important issue related to equal pay is comparable worth. Several states have implemented programs for comparable worth pay, whereby employers are required to compare completely different job categories. Those held predominantly by women, such as nurses and secretaries, must be compared with occupations predominantly held by men, such as truck drivers and warehouse workers. Point systems determine the level of skill involved in the job, as well as economic value of each position. If the classifications dominated by women are deemed comparable to those dominated by men, adjustments are made to reduce differences in pay. The important distinction between comparable worth and equal pay is that in order to claim a violation of EPA, identical job classifications must be compared. Therefore, if a woman accountant believes that she is not being offered a rate of pay equal to her male counterpart who is performing substantially equal work, 
she may have sufficient cause to claim violation of EPA. On the other hand, comparable worth compares different job categories. The Federal Age Discrimination and Employment Act of 1967, as originally written, protected individuals from ages 40 to 65 and then to age 70. A 1978 amendment permitted jury trials which gave claimants more power. Effective January 1, 1987, Congress unanimously approved and President Reagan signed into law H.R. 4154, amending ADEA by extending its protection to those beyond the age of 70. Now, most private sector and federal, state, and local government employers cannot discriminate against pay, benefits, continued employment, regardless of how old an individual may be. The Act also pertains to employees of employment agencies and labor organizations, as well as to U.S. citizens working outside the United States. The general citation for coverage under ADEA is employment of at least 20 employees. Part-time employees are included when calculating coverage. Section 501 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 prohibits discrimination against persons with disabilities by contractors doing business with the federal government totaling $2,500 or more per year. Those employers, who are government contractors, do business totaling $50,000 or more per year and have 50 or more employees must prepare an affirmative action plan to comply with the Act. The Act protects, quote, any person who has one physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of the person's major life activities, two, has a record of such impairment, or three, is regarded as having such an impairment. In July 1990, President George H.W. Bush signed landmark legislation known as the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, or the ADA, which prohibits all employers, including privately owned businesses and local governments, from discriminating against employees or job applicants with disabilities. Exempt are the federal government, government-owned corporations, Native American tribes, and bona fide tax-exempt private membership clubs. Religious organizations are permitted to give preference to the employment of their own members. The law requires every kind of establishment to be accessible and usable by persons with disabilities. The ADA pertains to employers with 15 or more employees and is monitored by the EEOC. Under the ADA, the term disability is defined the same as in the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, that is, as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits an individual's major life activities. The definition also encompasses the history of an impairment and the perception of having an impairment. Under the ADA, employers are required to make a reasonable accommodation for those applicants or employees able to perform the essential functions of the job with reasonable proficiency. Essential functions are loosely defined as the tasks fundamental and not marginal to the job. The Pregnancy Discrimination Act of 1978 recognizes pregnancy as a temporary disability and prohibits sex discrimination based on pregnancy, childbirth, or related conditions. Pregnant applicants may not be denied equal employment opportunities if they are able to perform the essential functions of the available job. Likewise, women must be permitted to work as long as they are capable of performing the essential functions of their current job or any job to which that they may perform, promoted, or transferred into. If an employer insists on establishing special rules for pregnancy, such rules must be directed by business necessity and related to issues of health or safety. The EEOC guidelines define religious and religious practices as moral or ethical beliefs as to what is right or wrong, which are sincerely held with the strength of traditional religious views. In 1972, Congress amended that portion of Title VII pertaining to religion in the workplace by expanding the definition to include an individual's right to, quote, all aspect of religious observance and practice, as well as belief, unless the employer demonstrates that he is unable to reasonably accommodate an employee's or prospective employee's religious observance or practice without undue hardship on the conduct of the employer's business. 
This amendment placed the burden on employers to prove their inability to reasonably accommodate an individual's religious practices. Certain work assignments might also require some adjustment if the individual raises religious objectives. For example, a foreign work assignment to a country whose prevailing religious practices conflict with the beliefs of an individual might be the basis for an individual's request to work at a different location. Every effort should be made to accommodate such a request. Balancing the individual's religious beliefs with an organization's dress and grooming practices might also become an issue. Unless safety is a factor, the employer should make realistic and reasonable efforts to accommodate religious-based attire and grooming. Religion and work should be kept separate, meaning that employers have the right to require quiet and unobtrusive observance. The Immigration Reform and Control Act makes the employment of illegal aliens unlawful and establishes requirements for employers to determine an individual's authorization to work in the United States. The act applies to employers with four or more workers. The Immigration and Naturalization Service INS, determines what constitutes an acceptable document proving work eligibility and identity. Some documents establish both identity and employment eligibility. In instances where these are not provided, documents establishing identity, in addition to documents establishing employment eligibility, are required. Employers must examine documents that establish an individual's identity and eligibility to work in the United States before completing the required I-9 form. This examination should be made subsequent to the final hiring decision to avoid violation of the Immigration Reform and Control Act provisions. Employers face penalties for hiring unauthorized employees and for failure to properly complete and maintain I-9 forms. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, has recently begun to increase the number of audits aimed at uncovering illegal hiring practices. Businesses are typically given three days to present I-9 forms for audits. If found guilty of knowingly violating verification laws, employers have 10 additional business days in which to rectify matters. If they do not, ICE may issue fines up to $1,100 for each illegal employee and impose criminal charges and recover assets. Anti-discrimination provisions of the Immigration and Nationality Act regulate unfair practices during employment eligibility verification. The primary intent of the Civil Rights Act of 1991 is to provide appropriate remedies for intentional discrimination and unlawful harassment in the workplace. It extends beyond the Civil Rights Act of 1964's Title VII make whole remedies of back pay, reinstatement, and some attorney's fees in several ways. Administered by the Wage and Hour Division, the Family Medical Leave Act, or FMLA, requires employees of 50 or more employees to grant up to 12 weeks of unpaid, job-protective leave in any 12-month period to eligible employees for the birth or adoption of a child or for serious illness of an employee, spouse, child, or parent. The Uniformed Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act of 1994 is known as ERISA and prohibits discrimination of employment based on military membership or service. Generally, a person reemployed by an employer is entitled to the seniority, status, pay, and other rights and benefits as if the employee would have received if the employee had stayed remained continuously employed. Employers are expected to train or retrain returning service members so that their skills are upgraded. The law also provides for the alternative reemployment positions if the returning service member cannot perform the duties of his or her original position. When employment is reactivated, the employee generally is protected from discharge for one year except for cause. The Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act of 2009 stipulates that an unlawful discriminatory act occurs each time an employee receives her paycheck, benefits, or other compensation that reflects a discriminatory practice. 
This resets the 180-day statute of limitations for filing an equal pay lawsuit with each new discriminatory paycheck. Employment laws and categories of discrimination do not preclude the employment and termination at will doctrines, which grant employers the right to terminate at any time for any reason, with or without cause, the employment of an individual who does not have a written contract defining the terms of employment, provided such termination does not violate state or federal laws. In exercising this right, employers are unlikely to incur legal liability. Negligent hiring and retention may occur when employers fail to exercise reasonable care in hiring or retaining employees. Increasingly, employers are being held liable for harmful acts committed by their employees both in the workplace and away from it. Plaintiffs must prove that the employee causing the injury was unfit for hiring, that the employer's hiring or retention of the employee was the cause of the plaintiff's injuries, and that the employer knew or should have known of the employee's unfit condition. Generally, the deciding factor is whether the employer can establish that it exercised reasonable care in, in ensuring the safety of others. Reasonable care may include conducting relevant pre-employment testing, checking references, investigating gaps in the empl applicant's employment history, verifying academic achievements, conducting criminal investigations, checking an applicant's credit history, or verifying the individual's driving record. Because Title VII did not immediately have the desired effect on discrimination, a series of executive orders was issued by the federal government, first by President Kennedy in 1961, and later strengthened by President Johnson in 1965. The best-known executive order, or EO 11246, contained an EEO clause that required companies doing business with the federal government to make a series of commitments. Three of the most significant commitments are to, one, practice non-discrimination in employment. When a company does business with the federal government, it is the basis of the contract. Should the company discriminate in its interviewing or hiring practices, it would effectively be in breach of contract. Two, attain affirmative action goals. This commits a company to hiring, training, and promoting a certain percentage of qualified women and minorities. The actual percentage is based on the number of women and minorities in specific geographic locations, referred to as the standard metropolitan statistic area. And three, obey the rules and regulations of the Department of Labor. The agreement extends to allowing periodic checking of premises by labor representatives to ensure compliance with the other two commitments identified here. The EEOC and OFCCP require private employers of 100 or more employees and federal government contractors or subcontractors with 50 or more employees and in contracts in excess of $50,000 to identify their workforce by job category as well as by race, ethnicity, and gender in the EEO1 report to be filed annually on September 30th with the EEOC. The preferred method of filing is via a web-based filing systems. Companies should expect to receive their EEO-1 filing materials no later than mid-August. Instructions on how to file are always available by the EEOC.